Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Bruce Yandel, economist and dean emeritus of the College of Business and Behavioral Science at Clemson University. Uh, Bruce is an authority on regulation, and Bruce has some very novel and interesting ways to look at regulation. And I'd like to uh, talk with you about that today, Bruce. Welcome to Econ Talk. Glad to be talking with you, Russ. Bruce, when we talk to our students, we often give examples of how economics justifies some form of government regulation in, in the case of, say, externalities or uh, public goods, where private voluntary decisions led by what we often sh- use the shorthand of the market for. We talk about the market could do this, the market could do that. We talk about often uh, examples like externalities where the market might not lead to the most uh, optimal or best outcomes. And so some people will then argue that government needs to step in. But before we evaluate the advantages of government versus a private solution, we want to know what government will do. A lot of times that's just taken as a given. Well, government will do the right thing. But, of course, it's a little more complicated than that, isn't it? It is. And, and you know, Russ, quite often I think <clears throat> it seems to be normal that most of us, when we talk about let's give this problem to government, uh, we we generally don't carry with that the idea that these market forces that play through our private lives are present in our public lives. So that uh, when we turn something over to government, we have another opportunity to talk about supply and demand and an economic analysis of what goes on there. And sometimes it's rather surprising. And a lot of that work was has been done here at George Mason University. Uh, treating politics or politicians as if they were like everyone else. That's a strange idea to some people. I think we have a tendency to romanticize politicians and see them as benevolent uh, voices of the people or taking care of the voice of the people or the will of the people. But they, of course, are under the same influences and incentives that everyone is. They may be a little bit different, but they have the same behavioral uh, challenges that we all have to do the right thing. And Often uh, they're going to respond to those incentives just as economics would predict rather than a more um, uh, idealized or romantic perception. Well, you know, one of the, I guess, one of the first and oldest and perhaps most honorable theories of political behavior or theories of politics, or we could call it theories of regulation, um, is the public interest theory. And uh, I have a lot of respect for that theory. I like it. Uh, but but it doesn't predict all that well, as reliably as some other theories. But the public interest theory says we elect good people to office, and, and they head off, and they do their dead-level best to serve the public interest. And lie awake at night trying to answer the question, what is in the public interest? Um, and then, of course, we go back to this thing we were just talking about. They're human beings, too, and they need to get reelected. So we've we find that they are rather sensitive to private interest as well, including their own. So we get a kind of mixed uh, uh, mixed set of theories here. Uh, I guess the more modern one, coming from from the program that where you did your doctoral work, Russ, is that wonderful uh, set of theories that George Stigler developed, and one he termed the economic theory of regulation. And... Uh, I remember that, you know, the idea that, hey, let's just perform a a, a mental experiment when the politician is wrestling with a decision. Well, let's just go out on the steps of the Capitol and auction the decision off to the highest bidder. And uh, let's try to get all the interest out there who would like to uh, see this come their way and say, okay, let's just hear the numbers, folks. And, of course, we know government doesn't operate that way, but it is a mental experiment, a thought-facilitating device that sometimes help us to, helps us to sort out who might be the winner and why. Well, I also like the idea of thinking about who might be in the bidding. That's uh, right. That's right. One of the incredible uh, uh, 
advantages of that thought experiment, which as you point out is, quote, just a thought experiment, but of course has some element of reality in it, is it, it forced you to think about, well, well, who has a stake in this regulation and who would want to speak up? Who would walk the halls of Congress uh, and try to influence a legislature, le- legislator, whether it was literally through a bribe or a bid of money, but but through other means, whether it's persuasion or or uh, influence of other kinds. Right, and and in a way, then you know, there's a footnote uh, that 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 relates to a theory that that I developed. It's sort of a footnote to the economic theory of regulation, but it also is a kind of straddle that goes back and touches on the public interest theory of regulation. And tell, and tell us about t- that. Hmm? Tell us about that theory, and I, I'd say it's more than a footnote. I, I, it's at least an appendix, but it's, right. or maybe a unpublished supplement, or, a, a, or maybe a, it's a long footnote. A second, a second volume. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell us about that theory. But uh, it's one that I call bootleggers and Baptists, and and uh, you know when 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 the the name of the theory is announced. Uh, Generally speaking, there are a good many folks who know exactly what's going on in the theory, but sometimes there are a few who puzzle over that title. Uh, but it comes out of a, it's somewhat regional in the United States, but generally rural, small town settings where the good Baptists who hope to see a diminution in the consumption of alcoholic beverages lobby the state legislature or city or county councils to shut down the liquor stores on Sunday. And, of course, when those stores close on Sunday, it doesn't mean that the demand for alcoholic beverages goes away. It may be somewhat frustrated. But then there are people in the community who say, well, I'm going to try to satisfy that demand, and, of course, we call them bootleggers. Uh, The illegal sellers of what would otherwise be legal booze, and they do it on Sunday with drinking houses. And, of course, the uh, bootleggers gain a market one day a week, and the Baptists can feel better, perhaps, about having closed down those legal liquor stores on Sunday. And when the legislative battle takes place, it's seldom, if ever, that the bootleggers will organize and go down and march with placards in front of the state capitol saying, help support your good bootleggers' efforts to earn a living. They don't have to do that. Uh, The good Baptists do the lobbying for them. And in a sense, both parties accomplish an end which they desire. But we would never think of them as being involved in a formal collusive effort or forming a coalition uh, bootleggers and Baptists for America, or something like that. So, so the uh, the title of the theory is actually based on a story about regulation, which is a rather common story uh, in some locales. And and of course we do get that piece of economic theory of regulation with the bootleggers there, and it's strictly for economic reasons, narrowly interpreted. And then we pick up the public interest theory with Baptists who are taking the high ground and adding a moral cover to the actions that the bootleggers desire. It allows the politician to get out on the hustings and say, uh, I, I have the moral high ground. I'm supporting the Baptist, the good-hearted, well-intentioned Baptist. And, of course, it also gives the politician the internal cover, the uh, – the soothing of the conscience that although the, the bootlegger may have made a contribution to to the politician's political coffers and may have helped out in some campaign or another, that's not the real reason. The real reason is the Baptist or in, in, in general terms, the, the altruistic motive. It's not the self-interested special interest that's being served here, but the, as you say, the public interest, right? And you know we find we find stories once you begin thinking about things, or as we say, if you want to use that lens in looking at at the world of political decision making, you begin to find some interesting stories uh, that get illuminated by that theory. The early English factory acts, which were early 18th century, were uh, led on the basis of a 
Blue Ribbon Committee, which wrote a recommendation to Parliament saying we need to uh, restrict the use of children in textile mills and so forth. And it turned out that leaders on that committee were owners of textile mills that had adopted the latest technology so that they used less labor. And they took the moral high ground and made it kind of tough on their competitors who used a lot of labor by ha- in, the, in as much as they raised their competitors' cost and did it in the name of a good cause as the public heard the appeal for a more humane workforce and work environment. Then as we uh, you know, fast forward, the turn of the last century, along about the early 1900s, there was a flurry of activity at the state level in the United States in the name of pure food, safe meat, coming out of state legislative bodies that initially had been lobbied by uh, local butchers and small meat packers in their states who were beginning to confront the sales outlets of the major packers out of Chicago, accommodated by the invention of the refrigerated rail car. And so all of a sudden, the, the good local butcher on the corner just couldn't compete And when they would make their appeal on the basis of try to buy your meat at home or take care of your local butcher, a politician would say, how can I give a speech on the floor of the of of our state uh, capitol just on a private appeal like that? Next thing you know, it'll be the hairdressers, and who knows, maybe even the economists will be asking Mm -hmm. to be protected. So uh, give me something to go on, and the appeal for safety, safer food, protect the commonwealth, uh, began to uh, take the day. And that, that safer food, the, the claim there was that, the, that these refrigerated rail cars were, were suspect. They weren't, they weren't reliable or they would break down, supposedly, whereas your local butcher would do a better job, right? Right. It was a quality control argument. And it had enough of a, um, enough validity in the sense of a theoretical validity to it uh, to uh, sort of take the day. And it was clear that uh, medical doctors and public health officials knew what could happen when uh, bad meat made its way into the family kitchen. So, uh, but you know, as, as that as that movement started, it then led to ultimately. Uh, a demand for federal regulation by the meat packers because they began to have to face regulations that were different across multiple states and so what they wanted was one regulation if they were going to live in a regulated world and there was only one place to get it Washington DC and they wanted one regulation that would be tailored in a way that could let them make as much money as possible as well that's right and and they had a problem too. Uh, there was uh, beginning to uh, that is uh, beef shipped in refrigerated ships from South America was beginning to come into American ports, and so the good Chicago meat packers basically took a page out of the book of the local butchers, saying, "Can we really trust those refrigerated ships? Are we going to allow tainted?" meat to come in and invade uh, the kitchens of America. Uh, We need to make certain that all meat is inspected by the United States government to protect us from those risks. And uh, so they got regulation that was thoroughgoing, uh, made it a little bit harder for the regional meat packers and startups to compete. Now this theory, the bootlegger and Baptist theory, which... It sounds kind of on the surface, you know, your first glance, if you're listening to this and you haven't heard it before, you'd say, well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, politics makes strange bedfellows. A lot of times different coalitions form. A lot of times some of them are pursuing their self-interest and some have altruistic motives. But the bottom line is, you know, these regulations that result are really okay. It's good not to have child labor and safe meat's a good thing and liquor sales on Sunday. I mean, that's not the... 
making them illegal. That's not the worst thing in the world. So one of the things that I just want to stop here for a second, Bruce, and we'll, we'll we'll talk some more about the theory. But one of the things I found once I've heard this story from you is that it, it changes the way you look at uh, the news and the newspaper because and the political process because so often these are – couched and framed in public interest only stories. And w- what I've learned from you is that inevitably there are bootleggers. And once you start realizing that in almost every one of these types of stories, in every new regulation that comes along is the result of both self-interest and altruism, that is a moral high ground and a not so moral high ground. One of the things I've found is it it, it forces you to not just say, oh, yeah, well, things are multifaceted, but it starts uh, you down a different path of how you think about them. And I, I just want to give you a couple examples and, and let you react to it. One of the things that always makes me think about is, is as you say, who's got a stake in this? Who else besides the, the crusaders, the moral crusaders, the public interest folks, or the alleged public interest folks are, are out there beating the drum for this regulation? Why did this regulation happen now? If this public interest case was so persuasive, what suddenly changed? And then for me, most importantly, what form does the regulation take? Because what I found when you when you got me to think about this is that it makes you realize that you know a lot of times there's a general public fervor for some something to be done. But what is actually done, the public doesn't pay quite so much attention to. And often that is where the uh, rubber hits the road, where – uh, an industry will support a regulation in the name of, of the public interest, but actually the actual regulation will not be particularly public interested and will will serve their special interests much more reliably. Right. You know, and sometimes it, it does generate <clears throat> what we might call a regulatory U-turn. Um, they, uh, by that I mean... Uh, sometimes you get just the reverse. For for instance, you may uh, you may be seeing something occur in the name of clean air, and as and once the regulation U-turn has occurred, you actually get dirtier air. Explain. And with a much higher price tag. I, I guess probably the the most famous example of this came out of amendments to the Clean Air Act in the mid 1970s requiring electrical generators, your your power companies, to place scrubbers on all newly built electrical generating plants or those that were substantially modified. Now, the scrubbers were not tinker toys. They required 10% of the energy coming out of a power plant to operate them and they used more land than the power plant itself. So we have to picture something that is really big. Yeah, when you think of a scrubber, you think kind of like a little brush at the top, That's of, right. the top of the pipe. But it's it's a little more elaborate. It, That's right. It's not a muffler on an automobile. It's almost an automobile on a muffler. <laughs> but So the, the purpose of the scrubber, a very honorable purpose, Let's take all of this carbon and fly ash uh, out of the air that is associated with burning coal. But turns out there were two kinds of coal, broadly speaking. There's clean coal, which comes out of the west, open pit mines, and there's dirty coal that comes out of the east. And so if you put a scrubber and you're burning dirty coal, the air gets cleaner. Uh, if you can use clean coal coming from the West, you don't have to buy those expensive scrubbers and the air gets cleaner. But by having, by legislation and then regulation, a requirement that every plant have a scrubber, then the operator of the plant might as well say, well, I'm indifferent. I might as well buy the cheapest coal I can buy, which happens to be dirty coal. And the end result was you keep burning dirty coal, and even with the scrubber, some stuff goes out into the air. So it was an incredibly expensive uh, journey that we took as a people. And uh, the, the advocates of clean air celebrated once that, once that statute came into being. They were the and, Baptists, and who were the bootleggers in that case? Well, and it was sort of interesting. The, uh, 
And, and I think it's an interesting point to, to make that sometimes, of course, there's more than one bootlegger and sometimes more than one Baptist. That is, as we begin to look around and say, well, who are the players here? Um, obviously, the owners of coal mines in the east where the dirty coal is mined, gained. It turns out that labor was organized in the east and not organized in the west. So you had a United Mine Workers in the east already organized. They had borne the cost of organizing, which gave them an advantage in speaking with one voice. And so organized labor. One, those jobs lasted longer than they would have otherwise. And perhaps some coal carriers, that is, some rail interests that were specialized in carrying coal from the uh, coal mines in the east to the power plants, gained. So you get you get uh, maybe two or three interests there. Well, don't forget the scrubber manufacturers. And of course, the scrubber manufacturers. That's they had, right. They had a slight interest in this. That's right. I don't know who made them. Do you have any that's, idea? That's Who's tech, right. Who owned that technology? I don't know. You know, I I don't recall. I think Coppers was one of the companies that was that was producing producing it, but the uh, and in a way it's sort of similar to the catalytic converter requirement for automobiles, which is a marvelous piece of technology. Well, the scrubbers are too. I mean, it's sometimes we have truly creative the the good creativity of uh, of, uh, of American innovation comes forward to address these problems with engineering marvels. Um, the catalytic converter is an example of that. General Motors had the patent on it. I don't know whether those patents have, have expired at this point or not. But at the time, the uh, effort was being made by U.S. EPA to uh, do something about tailpipe emissions from automobiles. There was competition, as you would expect, that uh, was powerful across automakers. Chrysler was working on what they called a clean burn engine and said, hey, give us a little bit of time. Uh, we'll design an engine just when operating as it normally will operate, it'll be cleaner. Uh, Honda was developing a technology. General Motors was working with the catalytic converter. And the catalytic converter won the day, ended the competition, and the rule says you've got to put a catalytic converter on your automobile whether it needs it or not, so to speak. So even though Honda had developed a clean engine, which was which had emissions that were cleaner than those coming out of an American automobile at that time with the catalytic converter, they had to put catalytic converters on their cars. It's unbelievable. To sell them in the U.S. And all of us who love clean air could celebrate and say, "Isn't it wonderful?" Now we don't. We've got something a little cleaner out there than would have been the case otherwise. But I think the key example, the key point here, which I, which is just extremely profound, in both the coal case and the tailpipe emission case, is that there's a tendency to think of the situation as should we regulate or should we not regulate. Equally important is the question: what form should the regulation take? Should it be a centralized, top-down, mandated solution of a particular technology? Or a standard that people have to, that manufacturers have to meet and find the best technology to meet that standard or pay the cost if, if they find it, they can't meet it any other way through some kind of fine. So in the case of the electricity plants, we could have as a nation said, okay, these emissions are bad, so we're going to monitor those emissions, ed- emissions, and if you exceed them by a certain amount, you have to pay a fine. So you have a choice. You can pay the fine or find some way to reduce the emissions. The way to reduce the emissions could be a scrubber, could be using cleaner coal from out west, could be finding some new technology that will come along. Instead, we said, you got to have a scrubber. Similarly with the cars, we could have said, as a nation, the politicians could have said, you've got to have a car that's this clean. It's got to have, it can emit no more than these levels of these chemicals, of these pollutants. Instead, we said, you've got to have a catalytic converter. Now, the result in one dimension, at least of the short direct effect, was cleaner air, although, as you point out in the case of the coal, it actually unleashed incentives that made the air actually dirtier, but the approximate impact was cleaner air, scrubber versus no scrubber.
catalytic converter versus no catalytic converter. But by forcing that mandated top-down technology, we lost the chance for all the innovations that would have potentially come along, and we forced some manufacturers to pay higher costs and actually to produce dirtier air, which is a just unbelievable thing. And I suspect that outside of a handful of listeners uh, who might have heard this story from you or some other uh, economic summary of it, that was a secret. As you point out, after these laws were passed, there was celebration in the environmental community. We did it. There was celebration among good-hearted people, good-hearted citizens who cared about the air. We did it. We made the air cleaner, but the devil was in the details. That's right. And, and you know, there's an interesting point there uh, that goes with, uh, with the, the point you were making. Anytime you see a technology-based standard, instead of uh, what folks in the business call a performance standard, which is what you were describing, that a performance standard says, we're not in the plumbing business, we're not engineers, we are in the environmental protection business, and we're going to protect the environment. Don't throw anything out there on this list, and if you do, we're going to get you. And we don't care how you clean up, that's your problem, friend. That's a performance standard. We rarely see those. Um, and so then you say, well, why not? So any, in any case, when anyone sees a technology-based standard that, that, that in effect says, here's how you must design your plant, or this is what you must put on the plant, then be very suspicious that there are some, some bootleggers hiding behind the hedges and some Baptists out there working hard to get that technology specified. You know, for, and from the politician standpoint, you know, this idea of concentrated benefits dispersed costs, which comes from our good friends there in public choice at George Mason, uh, the politician likes to deliver benefits to known receivers. We all do, as human. If we have a choice as giving something to someone out there, we would like to say, well, let's pick a person so that we really can look at them and see them smile when they get the gift. And so the politician wants to deliver benefits to known recipients, and particularly known recipients in his or her congressional district or state. Then if the cost of those delivered benefits can be spread thinly across everyone in the country, most of us won't even know we got hit with it. So technology-based standards enable a politician, in a sense, to target the delivery of a benefit to particular groups, and they know they have gotten the benefit. And technology-based standards will be paid for consumers the way all things are paid by, for by consumers. Get spread out there. It may be pennies or nickels or a few dollars on your power bill. And like everything else, things have just gotten more expensive. The uh, performance standards, by comparison, do not enable the politician to target who gets the benefit. It just gets diffused out there in this wonderful competitive world, and our power bills don't go up by quite as much, but nobody calls attention to that either. Well, it's hard to notice, and your yeah. incentive to notice is small as a consumer of those kind of changes. But I love the point about the identifiable beneficiaries. And the way I think about it, which is slightly different, but I, I assume a politician likes to claim credit for stuff, and I think it's easier to point to a scrubber and say, see, I mandated that scrubber. Without it, this smokestack would be dirtier. I'm making your air cleaner rather than saying, I passed a regulation that let this manufacturer, this, this power plant, find something that was better. And, you know, it's hard to – you can't point to it as easily. It's You can't claim – you can't claim it as easily, but your point's equally important, maybe more important, when you're sitting in your office trying to decide on Capitol Hill which one's better. In the case of the regulation that's the performance standard, the people who are going to benefit from that, they're not even maybe sure who they are. You don't know which technologies are going to come along, which innovations are going to come along to improve matters in response to that regulation. But when you mandate the technology with the command and control you know exactly who it is, and that person comes in the office and says, my way is the cleanest way. GM says to to the, to the uh, folks on Capitol Hill, 
the catalytic converter is the best way. Now, if you're having trouble trying to decide which is the best way, the catalytic converter, which is the guy in your office making the claim versus a more gen generic process called innovation and competition, I think it'd be easy to convince yourself that the catalytic converter is a sure, converter is a sure thing. And, and just Honda ought to go along with it and use them too, just, just to make sure. And, and, you, and of course, the, the regulators are not neutral parties in these matters either. And, and it's much easier for a regulator to know the world is regulated if it's a technology-based standard, if you have a standard that says you must put a catalytic converter on every new automobile sold in the United States, you either got them or you don't have them. If you have a performance standard that says tailpipe emissions must meet these minimum standards or else you're in trouble, the regulator has got to get out there and somehow measure and monitor and make certain that those standards are being met. Now, we all know the same thing can happen with the catalytic converter. They can be poisoned, and they're no longer effective. But the theory says, if you've got that piece of metal on your car, you're okay. If you don't have it, go to jail. And you've uh, done your job. Makes life a lot simpler for when, the regulator. When you're talking about the regulator, uh, you're talking about an administrator at the mm -hmm. Envir Environmental Protection Agency, the exactly. EPA. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, might think of politicians as regulators, but they often, and this is another aspect of this kind of process, they don't specify the regulations because they don't want to get blamed or take responsibility. They push the implementation down to the EPA or OSHA or someone else who then uh, it gets, often gets fought out in the courts. It's a very strange system of to me, a lack of uh, of accountability and responsibility. It's a very, I think, an un undemocratic um, way to do things, but it is the way it's usually done. The, you know, the uh, I've been doing some work, Russ, on tobacco cigarette regulation recently. Uh, involved in a little bit of a research project and a writing project. I've uh, gotten into the history of of uh, the negotiated agreement that came out of attorneys general suits against the four major cigarette producers in the United States long about 1998 as a result of suits that were brought simultaneously uh, by state attorneys general against the four tobacco companies uh, out of this out of this came an agreement a settlement uh, that required the tobacco companies to change their marketing practices and so forth. Uh, one of the main concerns addressed in the settlement, uh, sort of first paragraph, was let's make certain we do something uh, but to reduce uh, the instance of teenage smoking. Um, if we can slow it down there, then we'll have less of it, and, and that'll be a good thing for public health. As a result of these suits... Uh, which were all, we should say, which were all brought in the name of, of either helping the children. That's right. The teenagers right. or the non-smokers you know, via secondhand smoke or the ta uh, the taxpayers of each state who allegedly were bearing the burden of smokers' health costs, which, which I always found interesting because smoking, if it really does kill you quickly – is good for taxpayers because you don't have to pay as much for uh, Social Security That's right. uh, and and healthcare costs of of, of non-smokers, uh, excuse me, of smokers because they don't get old and get put on expensive machinery. So one of the stranger aspects of that theory, if you're really taking it seriously, is that w we should subsidize smoking because it saves taxpayers money. But let's put that to the side. That these these suits at the state level yeah. were all uh, crusading. Attorneys general who 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 were fighting for for the the little guy the the kids et cetera health wonderful altruistic things that's right but but you know the the point you were making is is so important that it that is it it, it immediately says if you look at the data it you immediately are left with a big question mark that says well what's really going on here because if you look at the data. The analysis that has been done by more than one person looking at life expectancies for smokers versus non-smokers, just as you've suggested, and then looking at the amount of taxes paid by smokers uh, 
state taxes paid on the cigarettes they smoke, you know, and adding up all of these numbers and making your estimates, just what you've said comes out of it. Hey, gee whiz, these people are not imposing any costs on their state governments. So they may be imposing costs on themselves, and we all do that. Um, so uh, what's really going on here? And as you dig into this thing, of course, the agreement itself generated a massive amount of cash flow. Billions of dollars, on average about $115 million is spread across the 50 states each year, forever. That is, this, is, this just goes on forever. Uh, the cigarette companies uh, signed on to this consent. They immediately raised the prices of their cigarettes by more than enough to fund the cash flow that now goes to states for the apparent purpose of doing things that might reduce the instance of teenage smoking or doing things to, to help defray Medicaid costs and so forth. That's what the big story is all about. Right. The big story was that the tobacco companies had to, had to pay taxes, the equivalent of taxes. They were actually – I think of it as extortion money. I think it's remarkable that this was considered constitutional. It basically, they said, we're going to take you to court and basically – Tie you up in court forever and shut you down, uh, or you can make a, a settlement, which they did. And the settlement is basically, uh, I think it's based on sales, right? They have right. to they have to send a certain amount of money to the state houses uh, every year, and the money is supposed to fund healthcare programs, which seems like a wonder on the surface. This seems like a great thing. They just yeah. turned. I mean, the attorneys general became tax collectors. And uh, so, so. But how did it actually? How's it actually working? You know, the, so the you know the politicians uh, who didn't have to raise taxes sang their praises because they 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 got the revenue without having to uh, have to confront angry taxpayers saying, "What are you doing to us now?" And they said, "Oh, those bad tobacco companies are the ones who are going to pay for all of this." But then, when you when you look at how the money got gets spent. Um, <clears throat> hardly any of the money, <clears throat> excuse me, hardly any of the money goes into programs that are targeted at children or teenagers about smoking. Um, there's a recommended share of the amount that goes to each state set by the uh, Communicable Disease Center uh, as what they consider to be kind of a minimum standard, something like 2.5% of the revenues just barely hits their standard. That amount isn't being spent. Uh, the bulk of the money coming out in several years recently went to offset shortfalls in just state revenues. It went into the general fund. So uh, when you dig around, you go back to the point you were making, Russ, if you dig around and just look at the numbers, first off, you say, well, there may not really be a problem here in terms of impact on health care expenditures. But if you're going to use the money for something about health care, at least there's something going on that's beneficial. Then when you go and look and see how the money was actually spent, it didn't go there. And meanwhile, the tobacco companies' profits have gone up. Um, so And they've gone up because the way the agreement was – and this is the part I, that I love about the story, the, the devil in the details. Yep. Uh, what this allowed them to do was effectively shut out uh, competitors. That's right. Correct? That's right. How does that work? That's right. In the agreement – that is, uh, if a new tobacco company, cigarette company, comes along post-agreement, then that cigarette company has to pay into the fund uh, the equivalent of existing firms on a per-cigarette basis. You know, otherwise, you'd say, hey, these tobacco companies, the big four, they raise their prices that's going to induce competitive entry of firms who had no part of this past, who didn't have any sick people out there to pay for and so forth. Well, that attempt occurred. That is, entry was induced and shut down immediately. There's still some pending suits out there, but basically shut down by the agreement itself. So it's just, uh, I guess, for people who would look at cartels with wonder, it's a wonderful cartel. Yeah. It's a cartel that was created by attorneys general, and they are the ones who enforce the law in their states. Uh, so this thing is, uh, you might say, bulletproof. So the existing uh, big four in the tobacco world 
which did face and could still face competition from smaller manufacturers, uh, producers. That's been basically uh, shut down. Made, right. It's been made a lot more difficult, which freed up those folks not just to raise their prices to uh, absorb the cost of that, uh, the payments, but maybe a little more also. That's right. Because they don't face as competitive right. as competitive that's environment. Right. And you know, Russ, the story keeps going. And the thing, I guess that's that's one of the things about the work you and I do. You get into something, and it's sort of interesting on its face, and you dig down a little bit, and it's it like gets picking more up a rock. I like yeah. lifting up a rock and seeing what's underneath. A lot of squirmy, unattractive things. That's right. But you know the the other piece of this thing, the tobacco farmers, they saw all of this taking place, and of course they were interested in this settlement, and they see these huge amounts of revenue being passed around, and they're not getting anything. And so the tobacco farmers saying, "Wait a minute! Everybody else is winning something here, but us." Um, and we'd like to increase our share of tobacco sales against the international sellers of tobacco in the United States. And we're not able to do that real well because of something we like, and that is the floor on tobacco prices for domestic producers enforced by the United States government, something we've lobbied for. But if we could get the government or somebody to buy us, to pay us, we would give up the price controls and go free market if they just pay us enough. And of course, the tobacco companies said, wonderful, that would reduce our cost. And so, by George, in fact, the tobacco companies said, we would contribute to the buyout, which they did. And so, you know, as this I've thing... Not, I've, I don't know about this. So, basically, before the settlement, it's always one of the other bizarre aspects of, of the regulatory world yeah. we live in, before the settlement, we had all this um, public service stuff trying to get people not to smoke. That's right. But at the same time, we were subsidizing uh, tobacco farmers with a price floor that guaranteed a certain level, of presumably, of profitability for them to stay in the tobacco business. That's correct. Right? Now, you're saying that once the settlement was in place, the tobacco farmers – Offered to sacrifice the price floor. That's right. Allow international comp more international competition as That's long right. as they were paid off enough. If they were paid enough. <laughs> and, and where did that money come from? <laughs> well, part of it came from you and me and all the other good taxpayers. But another another big chunk of it came from the big four tobacco companies. From the settlement. From and that's right, and so they said, "Okay, we'll just notch our prices." I guess we'll just notch our prices up a little bit more, and uh, if you guys will keep the door closed on new competition, uh, it's just wonderful what a durable monopoly can do. <laughs> so so far, we start off with the regulation, a, a, a political outcome that was going to save the children. Right. And tax the really wicked uh, tobacco companies to fund those new health programs. Turns out about two and a half percent of the money goes to that. The rest goes to higher profits for tobacco companies because they can raise their prices because they've shut out competition. Some funding of tobacco farmers to keep them in um, nice cars and uh, other luxuries. There's another group though we haven't talked about, which is the lawyers. Oh boy. You know, Russ, uh, no one knows exactly how much the private attorneys got. That is, the attorneys general, in effect, turned these matters over to private attorneys, plaintiff's attorneys, to do the work on the suits. Um, there's something like t the estimate of what will be paid by the big four tobacco companies across the life of this thing, which just goes on, is 200 billion dollars in total. It's estimated that 25% of that goes to the private attorneys who were bringing these suits. Um, there are individual attorneys who have received a billion dollars. Well, that's fair. They work hard. Sure they do. They're smart. Yeah. But but that's another piece of the, <laughs> another piece of the story, of course. And of course, the other part that's delightful is that the so all this funding 
which was supposed to come out of the hide of the evil tobacco companies, which is always an attractive uh, political uh, flag to wave around, ends up really coming out of the pocket of smokers. That's right. Who are, on average, poorer than the average American. So we have what is effectively an incredibly regressive tax, that is a tax that that is paid disproportionately by lower-income people. So lower-income people who still smoke are funding billion-dollar, hundreds of millions of dollars, millions of dollars to lawyers, tobacco farmers, stockholders of tobacco stock corporations, and um, – did I miss anything? It's yep. pretty, well, it's pretty they, ugly. Pretty you know, ugly. A big picture. chunk of money that just goes in the general fund, so that the ordinary taxpayers in states who might have to have their taxes higher to obtain the benefits that they're getting from their state governments don't have to pay those higher taxes, if, particularly if they're not smoking. But there, there is, there are pieces of these payments that are going into health care, things related generally, but by and large, it's just uh, the funds are going into all the good things that state governments do for their citizens, so to speak. I guess, you know, when we when we just get down to the bare bones economics of it, probably the most, if you want to see a reduction in the consumption of cigarettes, the most direct way to do it is to let the price go up, and that's happened. So there is a price effect out That's there. True. And uh, we did get a little less smoking, I assume. Yep, yep, yep. yep. So. But but you know, Russ, the uh the the, uh, the 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 thing that got me started down the bootlegger Baptist road um uh, had to do with an incident. Uh, I was working in Washington in nineteen seventy six, seventy seven, working with a group that was reviewing newly proposed regulations yeah, on well, part of White House staff, small group. Uh, we would be assigned a, a newly proposed regulation out of the Federal Register and, and say, how about taking a look at this and see if you can find a lower-cost way to, to achieve the goals and objectives of this regulatory agency and so forth. And so we were digging around. And one that was assigned to me was a new lawnmower safety standard. There was a lot of good data that gets uh, that gets accumulated from a network of information systems that link all of the major hospitals in America to one big computer. So uh, emergency room data is there, and somebody has a count of how many people are injured what way by projectiles coming out of lawnmowers. And we we know those things can be dangerous. But there was a proposed rule that was just going to make a lawnmower one of the safest things known to man. They were going to be skirted. Uh, they would have dead man clutches and so on and so forth so that uh, you would really have to work hard to uh, hurt yourself uh, with a lawnmower. When you say a dead man clutch, you mean something that would uh, inact make the mm-hmm. lawnmower inactive if mm-hmm. it had contacted if, if, anything? Or... If you let go of the lawnmower or 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 it hits some kind of object, it would automatically disengage the blade from the engine and so forth. Uh, Seems like a good and, thing. Uh, oh, good lands. The price increase associated with this proposed rule from the Consumer Product Safety Commission was extraordinary. I had a good friend who was a president of a lawnmower manufacturer, and he was renting my house while I was in Washington just coincidental and so I was back home checking on the house went to a reception and there he was and I said don't give me any bad news about the house but there's something I want to ask you about (laughs) what do you think about this lawnmower standard well I just knew what he was going to say I just knew he was going to rant and rave about government saying how awful it is this is the worst thing that could have happened look what they're going to do to our cost he didn't do that at all he said I want to get you over in the corner and tell you something. And I thought, well, what's going on? So we got behind a palm tree, and here's my friend saying, Bruce, this is the best thing that could ever happen for our company. All these new regulations. How could that be? Yeah, he says we are are achieving something, if this becomes final, that would be prohibited by the Clayton Act and the Sherman Act. 
we're going to drive most of our competitors out of business. And why was that? He said, those mom-and-pop shops that are out there buying a Briggs & Stratton engine and mounting it on a piece of sheet metal with a blade on the bottom, they will never be able to bear the cost of research and development or whatever is necessary to meet these regulations. And we will be there when the last roll is called. <laughs> and so they, strangely enough, supported yep. this regulation with with a good conscience because it was for safety. Yep. Right. That's right. But of course, it meant, as a result, higher prices for everybody. Right. And a one-size-fits-all solution. If you wanted to just be careful while you were mowing, and take that saved money and yep. do something more productive with it, you weren't allowed yep. to. And, and and so did it pass? And you know the the U-turn piece of it, which would eventually have disappeared. But the U-turn piece says. You better keep those old lawnmowers running as long as you can, cousin, because when you have to replace it, you're really going to have to pay a price. Oh, yeah. And so did that regulation pass and stay in place? A version of it did. A, a weaker, less costly version passed, but it was one that required enough uh, appliances to the lawnmowers that it had an effect on the number of producers out there. But it... But it was that conversation that, uh, you know, here I was riding on a white charger with my comp competitive Lance saying what we have to do is just get the world more competitive. And if these folks in Washington would, Washington would just read the first chapter in a principal's book, none of this stuff would be happening. Well, I figured I, I learned that there was a better theory than the one I was using to explain the way the world was working. And the sort of bootleggers and Baptists were born that day. And they, they are they are everywhere. Uh, and, and one of the things that explains that, that you just alluded to is the seemingly surprising support for regulation that often comes from large producers who you'd think would say, well, you know, we don't want regulation because that imposes costs on us. But actually, those costs are usually more easily borne by the large producers, they ha they they can take advantage of economies of scale. Often they're already doing the regulations or complying with the regulations. So what this does is force out their small competitors and give them uh, more market share and more market power. It's very depressing. That's right. Yeah, but that's uh, that's part of that's you know, and and in, in the work that you and I do, we we're we're trying to explain the way the world works. Some of the time, not necessarily the way we would like for it to work, but that's where the bootleggers and Baptist theory rests. It rests out there in an attempt to try to explain what's going on and to predict what's going to happen, as opposed to the other time in our lives when, in a sense, we are, we are preaching for a competitive world and we would like a particular outcome to occur. But this, this set of theories falls into that box that we call positive economics. Let's try to figure out what's going on and be better equipped to uh, live in this world. Well, let me let me ask you, we're almost out of time. Let me ask you a speculative question. You know, one way to look at this conversation is that is to say, well, you know, that's just the way the world is. As you say, you know, well, if you if you if you want regulation, which is often popular, uh if you want to have cleaner air, once you throw that issue into the political sausage factory, yes, it's going to get chewed up and special interests are going to have their way. And that's just the price we pay for the political process. That's just part of the deal. So we, we like cleaner air. The average person doesn't pay attention to the fact that GM's got the patent on the catalytic converter. The average reporter forgets to find out about it or doesn't notice it. Uh, if they do, it's too small a story, or it's just a splashy one-day expose. The average citizen doesn't doesn't take notice of it. So we continue to clamor for regular clean air, clean air. That's what we want. What we get is clean air via the catalytic converter, which is not the best way to get there. The performance standards say would have been better. And so there's a temptation. Say, well, it's better than nothing. Uh, if you if if you're going to have a political process, you have to be realistic. This is what you get, and uh, that's just the way it is. Do you feel that way? Well, I, uh, I, I mean, I think I think you get to that point, but 
uh, you get to that point for a while, and you say, "Well, there have there has to be there has to be something else that we can introduce as a people uh, to make uh, the folks jump through some hoops, and let's try to pull the covers back and find out what is going on here." And and so we say, "Okay, there's an Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the White House." The purpose of that and the invention of that was to, in a sense, put a traffic cop in an intersection where all this regulation is attempting to pass and become final. And the traffic cop says, before you can become final, you've got to pull the covers back, and we've got to look at what you're doing. You've got that way. We'll find out who the interested parties are. You're going to have to consider alternative rules. You can't just ride on one horse. And so you've got to show us alternatives, and then we're going to make a lot of noise about what you're doing if it looks too costly. And so I think as a people, we do have to have alternatives um, put before us so that at least we're better informed about what is going on. Uh, the other alternatives, I think, Russ, is would be to try to limit what gets placed in the congressional hopper to regulate and there are a lot of alternatives, as we both know, to doing things about the environment based on property rights and market forces and competition. Well, can you talk about that for a minute? Because I don't want our listeners to assume uh, there's a there's a certain um, misinterpretation you could put on what we're saying, which is, oh, all these regulations, see how horrible they are? Uh, they're all a big mistake. They're all special interest oriented. And, and a listener could say, well, that's just naive. You know, if, as I said a minute ago, if you, if you want regulation, of course the government and the political process is going to monkey around with it. And uh, come on, you got to have, you got to do something. So that's that's the best of not the best of all possible worlds, but that's that's the reality. Mm -hmm. But what you've also shown, let's if we go into this briefly, I think it would be very beneficial. You've also shown, I should have Bruce, I have plenty of time. I just don't want to impinge on your schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, you've shown that. A lot of times these centralized regulatory solutions have alternatives, and the alternative isn't dirty air. The alternative isn't unsafe uh, uh, products. The alternative is a different way to restrain uh, the market forces that we are worried about. And I know you've done a lot of work on the role of uh, common law in right. cleaning up the air, and I'd love for you to talk about that because well, I, there's a certain – Again, yeah, and, romance people have that, well, if we didn't have this regulation, everybody would be out there polluting, and it would be a horrible thing, and the world would be filthy, and, and if it weren't for the EPA, we'd all be choking to death. But there's a different right. interpretation. And it's understandable that that that, that is the reaction, uh, because from most of us are, are as, as, as we say in our trade, Russ, we are rationally ignorant about these things, gee whiz, we... We can only be informed about a small number of things, the things that help us make a living or the things that we enjoy doing in our personal lives, and, and most of us are not following uh, amendments to the Clean Air Act. But And most of us don't realize that there was something else that worked before 1970 when the EPA was created. That is, we didn't move from a jungle with gook up to our eyeballs one year in 1969 to something better a promised land after that but so when when sometimes when you suggest well let's just turn off this epa switch momentarily and think about what the world might be like otherwise uh, typically just as you say people would say if you want to paint a picture of the world without epa we're all gasping our eyes are burning and uh, the lakes are on fire but prior to having all the federal regulation we had 50 states with regulation. We can we throw that in. And none of them had a monopoly on how it could be done for the entire United States. And so we had a wonderful kind of experiment of federalism at work. And, of course, there were some states that had stricter standards than others. But as time passed and as incomes would rise, people would want to live in a cleaner world in every state became involved in what is called a race to the top, where previously some of them would be involved in a race to the bottom. Let's just make it as dirty as we can to get some industry down here. But uh, economic progress causes a race to the top to begin to occur, and you get the wonderful competition. 
of different ways of addressing the same kinds of problems. Then on underneath all of that was the old common law, the individuals who, at common law, no individual has a right to impose cost on his neighbor against his neighbor's will. And that includes air pollution, water pollution, every other kind of waste you can think of. And if they do, you've got a cause of action against that party and take them into court. If it's a lot of folks, you get the attorney general to take them into court. But people say, gee whiz, that means we have to sue everybody to get them to stop blowing smoke into the air. No, you sue a few of them. And the penalties are so severe that the rest of them begin to take notice. Then we have to look at the record of what is going on. Uh, we do not, we will never have 100% compliance with regulations, so you get variable compliance to uniform rules. When we have states doing things differently, you have variable rules, and there's no reason that you would have worse compliance. So there is an alternative out there, an alternative that worked but not perfectly, mm-hmm. but got but but an alternative that was wiped out uh, by the federal engines that we built. And I think it's at... kind of possible to get back part of that world. It's, I think it's totally unrealistic for anyone to say, "Oh, I think what we'll see started is a political movement that's going to." dismantle EPA and it's going to go away next year or in three or four years. Uh, There are very powerful things that that agency does that provides a baseline that would be supportive of common lawsuits and would be supportive of stronger state actions. And so I think we can perhaps push in that direction. Talk for a minute about the empirical uh, side of this. I think, again, if our listeners don't know the data, the way it sounds, you're saying, okay, we've got all this federal centralized regulation. Let's imagine a past which existed pre-1970 where state regulation and and the potential of lawsuits kept the air clean. And and people, I think, will respond to that and say, oh, but federal regulation is so much better, and there's a lot of theoretical reasons why it's better which is you know, one regulation. You don't have to learn about each state where you operate. And it, in theory, there are economies of scale and regulation and all the knowledge about it could be in one place and one or agencies. There's a lot of arguments that are theoretical about the advantage of centralized federal regulation that I think would worry people about a state-based and a common law-based uh, legal environment as a way to create cleaner air. So I think the key point that that is often forgotten is that we have data we have we have a history of what actually happened pre-1970 and if you look at the data you'll see that between say 1950 and 1970 the air was getting cleaner and cleaner and this is true of of a myriad of regulatory agencies that always claim that they've made the world a better place well the world has gotten better while they've been in existence but if you look at what happened before they were in existence, the world was getting better also. So if you look at, say, um, my favorite's the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit, people talk about how it saved lives. Well, if you look at fatalities per mile driven since the, when the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit was in place, they fell dramatically. Or, of course, they fell dramatically before it was put in place. That's right. Because people, as you point out, through a higher standard of living, wanted safer cars, we're driving more carefully, has n- had nothing to do with the federal regulation. And, ser- and similarly, in the case of the environment, yes, the air has gotten cleaner since the EPA has been in existence, but it was getting cleaner before. And it's an empirical question as to which which was more effective and which was more costly. Because the EPA is extremely costly, and what it has bought us is not necessarily an improvement relative to trend, which is the thing you want to use. And you know, and when we start, uh, uh, as, as not not good English, but we start from where we are at. <laughs> if we start where we are, uh, with a bureaucracy that has grown quite large uh, in, in terms of the environment, or, or we can point in any direction, consumer safety or whatever, we 
we start with a huge bureaucracy that has developed as a result of all of these forces we've been talking about, and including our yearnings for a better world. And, and we know at the same time that it's logical that decentralized approaches have some merit. Uh, it brings the competitive spur back into the problem. It gets people on the ground who are most concerned and most benefited from environmental improvements, looking at what is going on, get them into it. They, they take on ownership. And you say, well, how can, how can we get some of that, given where we are? And one of the things that I've proposed, uh, Russ, just you know, for the purpose of, hey, let's talk about something, would be a system of waivers. That is, we've got the federal rules, and so I'm not going to suggest that we repeal the Clean Air Act. I'm going to suggest that we allow a system of waivers within the Clean Air Act for any state or community that wants to come forward with a, another proposal and the burden is on them to show that their proposal is at least as good as what would be accomplished under the federal mandate. Associated with that would be uh, to encourage Congress to allow experiments, uh, and that could be that could be in the context of waivers. But there's a huge amount of knowledge that we are losing, and we're just not getting the benefits. And I guess ultimately that is the economic problem, is how to get all of these minds and brains connected that are out there so that we are using this vast amount of creativity and knowledge to address some of our most pressing problems. Um, knowledge does get centralized in one place, and there's not any incentive to get the other brains connected. Hmm. Uh, so uh, trying to trying to break through the concrete, get more experiments, get some waivers on command and control uh, is perhaps uh, one way of getting a little more light on the subject. Well, I like that idea. Of course, when you say waivers, it sounds like you're freeing people up from the regulation and therefore they're going to be lax. But you're what you're suggesting is a beautiful idea, which is if you can do it better, why not let them? Yeah. And of course, the political process, um, as we've been talking about this uh, this whole time, doesn't always have an incentive to look for those better solutions, and may not uh, be too keen on that waiver concept because that takes away the ability to take credit and point to who benefited and identify those beneficiaries. So my source for optimism is always the idea that. That if we could get people to be more aware of how the sausage factory works, maybe we'd be a little more careful about what we put in the sausage factory. And so I, I'm uh, I'm naive enough to think that economic education and will uh, encourage people to push their representatives a little bit in the direction of uh, a little more creativity, a little more competition, a little less command and control. That's right. That's right. And and we and we do live in a world where one person can make a difference. And and these ideas matter. I agree. Hey, it's fun talking with you. It's great. My guest today has been uh, Bruce Yandel, economist and dean emeritus of the College of Business and Behavioral Science at Clemson University and the creator of the bootlegger and Baptist theory, which uh, I hope you will find uh, in the world around you as, as I have. Thanks for joining us, Bruce. It's great. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. Mm-hmm.